strategy out of 2020 Nomura has a title saying that they remain selective as macro support wanes. And I reckon in, in, in a succinct way, yeah, there isn't a better way, there, there isn't a better fashion to put forth uh, what uh, the implication of this would be on, 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 on the Indian equity markets. And the author of this note, Sam Mukherjee, along with his colleague Milot Pal Sahu, have written a fairly exhaustive one. We'll, we'll get him on the show today to try and talk about it in a concise fashion over the next 20, 25 minutes to give us a sense of how Nomura is thinking about the macro implications and the micro implications on the equity markets, Indian equities in particular. Uh, Saiwa, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Hope all is safe. Yeah, thank you. I hope all is safe at your end as well. That's what all okay thus far, Sion. Um, briefly, Sion, when, when we, whenever at the start of the year, one thinks about how would the equities set up and turn out to be, one reflects back upon how the last year was. And maybe last year was a year of very strong earnings growth, great macro support, and fading FI flows within that context. And of course, the global picture. So put that into perspective. How do you expect some of these variables to change? And what's the kind of impact that you believe they can have on Indian equities? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, Neeraj, uh, last year, and even actually the year before since the sort of pandemic unfolded. So one of the things, as you know, was the unprecedented uh, monetary support that came from all the large central banks. And if you, if you see, India has been a beneficiary. So, of course, last year, as you mentioned, uh, there was FII selling. But again, if you look at, you know, there's a lot of support in the primary market, though in the secondary market, you know, the selling continued. But the year before, FII buying was very strong. And there was, you know, and if you compare inflows into India compared to other uh, emerging markets, uh, India outperformed quite significantly. Uh, luckily for India, when FI thing was happening, it is also supported. It was supported by the domestic flows. So we have seen uh, substantial flows into uh, the mutual fund. We have also seen direct retail participation. That sort of helped the broader market as well, especially the mid and small cap. You know, so overall the flow support uh, was reasonably strong, quite strong for India for the last you know couple of years. Now the question is, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, to take a call on markets based just on the flows is a very difficult task, but we have to acknowledge that flows did play a very important role uh, in the recent past. So the question is how that, you know, this sort of pans out uh, going forward. So incrementally, you know, what we get concerned about is the uh, headwind in terms of the way inflation is uh, picking up. The inflationary expectations are rising. Uh, the job market, as you know, uh, is quite tight, particularly in the U.S. So our macro team, uh, particularly from the U.S. perspective, uh, is 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 sort of very cautious. So there is a possibility that uh, we may see a faster rate of tapering uh, this time around, as the concern on growth is that much lower and concern on inflation is sort of rising. So that support is not going to sort of probably going to come back. Domestically speaking, I think the rise in interest rate is again something which we are looking forward to. I mean, uh, you know, from a policy rate perspective, our team expects almost 100 basis point uh, increase this year by the central bank. Uh, it's being pushed out, the rate hike or tightening cycle is being pushed out as every time the growth concern comes to the fore. But given what's happening globally, uh, we can't be left far behind it. At some point, that rate hike cycle would start. So the interest rates are going higher. And if you have a period of muted returns in equities, then the question is that can the current uh, sentiment sort of you know, continue? So uh, it, to that extent, I think we had seen a very good flow support, which may wane uh, as we go into next year. And the second point that you mentioned about uh, corporate earnings, again, I think uh, you know, it's been unprecedented. I mean, it's quite surprising in a way that in a pandemic year, uh, I mean, every year we uh, had, you know, uh, earnings miss. I mean, if you look at, you know, for the last many years, probably 10 years, uh, whatever the growth expectations were, we were always missing that. FY22 is the first year where, uh, in many years, where you actually would have a earning, which is more than what the consensus was expecting at the start of the year. Now, I think there are, you know, a couple of factors. So as you know, the Indian corporate earnings have been falling, the return ratios of the ROEs have been coming down. So there was enough pressure uh, on the corporate India to sort of 
manage this in terms of improve uh, you know reducing the, the cost uh, you know structure or uh, improving the capital allocation so these are things which were happening even before the pandemic a pandemic accelerated uh, some some of the other things like market share gains uh, for the larger players right uh, you had lower overhead costs and then the commodity part of the market uh, which is a big contributor to sort of earning so the earnings to gdp ratio the much awaited rise in earnings to gdp ratio is taking place to, you know currently as earnings uh, growth is outpacing the economic growth so uh, what we are now expecting that by fiscal 24 uh, you know you will probably get closer to fy7 levels of earnings to gdp ratio so the profitability sort of is you know playing out uh but this you know this has there is some there is a there is up, up to a limit up to which you can do that and beyond that it comes down to the broader economic growth and that's where our concern starts to rise that as we go through 2022 uh, the markets would uh, being forward looking would start look at fi24 and beyond and that's where some of these fundamental questions will start to arise so these are the two major macro concerns we have one is flow related support and one is the broader economic growth uh, beyond the pandemic, uh, which sort of makes us more cautious and selective in our approach. So a couple of follow-ups there. One on the flow-related piece, Sion. Uh, your note puts on this very interesting chart about how foreign holdings have fallen to historical lows. And at the same time, the domestic uh, retail investor, whether via the mutual fund route and the SIP route or direct ownership, has kind of come in in a big way. And from what discount brokers or brokers tell me, 1.5 crore DMAT accounts getting added every year means that the flows are likely to continue. Uh, suffice to say that, therefore, 2021 was proof that foreign institutional outflows from the secondary markets haven't been as big an influence as they used to be. How do you anticipate the next two or three years to be wherein most global brokerages, I presume, including yours, are probably wanting to sit on the sidelines on India because of the valuations. Uh, do you reckon outflows will continue? Do you reckon after a year of very large outflows, the outflows could moderate even if there are no inflows? And what's the impact that that could have on the valuations, considering the fact that the domestic flows are very strong? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the outflows can continue because we have to also take into account that we had a big beneficiary of uh, the inflow and you know if you look at the india in the context of the emerging markets india has got more support than many of the emerging markets including china where there have been a lot of you know concerns now at the margin you know what we think is that uh, that attractiveness of india uh, you know, versus other markets, if those uh, starts to do well and the risks that people are talking about uh, starts to abate, uh, then you could see, uh, you know, the overall liquidity itself is coming down. So one issue is that uh, if inflation were to sort of uh, become a bigger issue going forward, you may see, uh, you know, the contraction in the balance sheet of central bank even more. So if you think about US Fed, we went, went from 4 trillion to 8 trillion plus. And we're talking about, you know, coming down to seven or slightly lower. We are still talking about uh, having enough liquidity. So can it come down even more? The answer is uh, obviously yes, depends on how, uh, you know, sort of inflationary outlook sort of starts to pay out. And within that, you know, if you have, uh, you know, attractiveness in other markets, uh, right? So some of the export oriented markets, uh, which starts to do well, uh, then you could see a situation where the relative, uh, you know, interest in India sort of, uh, you know, sort of comes down. And to that extent, I feel the, uh, you know, the flow related FI flows can uh, continue to uh, be negative even in uh, 2022. As far as domestic flows are concerned, obviously, you know, this has surprised us quite strongly. Uh, I mean, uh, quite positively. I mean, it's very difficult to, and you, you see us, you know, sort of an inflection in flows in a way. The SIPs, if you see, has also seen a, uh, you know, fairly good leg up. Uh, I think that's a function of, uh, you know, the way the markets have behaved and also the alternate asset classes uh, that you have, uh, you know, for investment. And especially with the interest rates sort of going higher uh, in the in the quarters to come. Uh, and if, I don't know, I mean, if that sort of is 
uh, uh, you know, uh, this comes along with a muted equity performance, then you may not get that, uh, you know, support. So very difficult to predict that, but, you know, we need to be uh, aware. I mean, you can't really bank on flows alone because these things can uh-huh. change depending on the sentiment a lot. So, so ultimately, we have to sort of look at the fundamentals more closely and just depend on the flows. But given what has already happened and the macro scenario, the way it is playing out, I think we should not bank too much on flows and assume that you know the flows itself will save us. So we have to sort of pivot ourselves, our expectation more on the fundamentals going forward. No, most certainly. Uh, the small other question that I have, Sion, is uh, on earnings, which is something that you referred to as well. And now, they may stay strong until, I presume, your analysis suggests FY24. Beyond that remains to be seen. But if GDP growth is below trend, and when I look at uh, your the earnings table as well as the chart that you've given, which shows that metal earnings which drove FY22 will come off quite significantly, though banking, etc., all steps up. Do you, do you reckon that the step up in banking, which is a wide expectation, but not a certainty considering how Omicron and some of the other variants keep on disturbing and making it a stop start economy. Could there be a room for disappointments in earnings growth in FY23? Or do you reckon the chances or the probability is very less there? So, you know, uh, yeah, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, dependence on banks will increase going forward because, you know, as uh, you know, metals or commodities uh, start contributing less and less. Uh, and IT services is another one which also continues, and I think we are fairly okay with that. But, you know, banking, the issue in banking is that, uh, you know, the way the situation is today, we are not uh, taking a very alarming call. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, that there is a possibility because the the impact of the pandemic, the impact of the scarring that has taken place and how this sort of plays out over time. So at this point, we are not able to see, uh, you know, some of these issues which can crop up. Uh, You know, the concern that I have is that uh, there is a very good expectation on, let's say, credit quality or credit cost at a multi-year low is what is assumed for all the big banks, right? because they have been prudent, they have been cleaning their balance sheet and all of that has been happening. So so there is some truth to it, but this pandemic is a disruption which has got created and therefore there is a risk to the credit cost estimate given the very elevated expectation that we are already sitting on. There may be some uh, slip even on the credit cost, but the fact is, you know, there is uh, these bigger banks uh, which are sort of able to gain market share to that extent uh, you know, they, there is some support that they may be able to get in the near term, but eventually the loan growth expectation and uh, the loan growth expectation would be linked to the broader economic growth. So, if I put all this in perspective, I think maybe we will not see the kind of disruptive earnings that we had in the recent past when the balance sheets were sort of uh, you know uh, was an issue or the credit uh, or the asset quality was an issue, but. Uh, going forward, some disappointment, given where the elevated expectations are, is is something which we can't completely sort of rule out. I think, you know, if not in 23, in 24 at some point, but, you know, the market, as I said, like being forward looking at some point in 2022 would look beyond 23. It would, it has already sort of, you know, would price in 23 uh, quite well in advance. So, so I would agree that, uh, you know, uh, far out earnings 24 and beyond. Uh, some of these risks may, may start to play out and the overall earnings growth picture may start to uh, taper down a bit depend, given the dependence on banks that we have at a nifty level. Okay, so be, be, before I get into some specifics based on your note, let me just ask you a broader question. Uh, maybe beyond 23, so 24 or even or beyond 24, where what are those structural themes where you believe at least the earnings growth disappointment is very less because I, if I read your note and you're saying that you're very, very selective, I would, I would want to understand from you what are the factors that lead you to be selective, or rather, what are the factors within themes which make you believe that these are the themes that you would be constructive on, irrespective of how the what I mean by irrespective is that not that you will ignore them completely, but you would still be okay because the earnings growth would compensate for some of the other negatives. What are those themes? So, you know, some of the themes, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, what we 
see where actually we think that you know you will also see uh, even the near term ones are getting supported is essentially you know it services now it services i know there has been a big uh, run up but we think there are some structural changes which is happening in the industry right so which sort of uh, has a creates a different picture on growth and margins from a medium term uh, perspective uh, so we need not anchor ourselves with what was happening few years back and you know what the valuations were uh, because if there is this structural change if that doesn't wane in the next few uh, you know next few uh, years i think the valuations can remain elevated may they may even end up uh, you know somewhat but you would still get returns in line with the broader earnings growth so that's one theme which we are uh, sort of you know, relatively more constructive on second theme is um, you know uh, the you know the you know the, on this whole industrial uh, i would say you know investment led or effort towards the manufacturing uh, led growth now this is a, uh, this is a piece which moves a lot more slowly but what we are encouraged is that uh, there is an action in that direction so i i mean uh, you know we, we we are not really uh, you know we 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 are, we are probably not able to see very clearly at this point that how this will all play out but there is a potential like for instance if you look at the pli scheme and some of the uh, sectors right which are uh, rising sectors now whether india can take a lead uh, in those sectors and establish itself as a manufacturing hub is a possibility at least there is a thought which is going on a lot needs to be done manufacturing is not just about incentive it's about technology it's about people it's about you know human resources so all that you need to get in place you need to get uh, you know some of the uh, well known companies uh, in the in the world to come and uh, sort of invest so those processes uh, we have to wait and see how that sort of plays out but at least you know there is a movement in that direction and i think the space you know in general the valuations doesn't look very elevated to us so so therefore we feel that uh, you know there are apprehensions in the market compared to let's say the consumption space where i think the investors are a lot more comfortable so to that extent this is a theme which we would sort of uh, i'm 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 I, we are expecting that we will latch on to irrespective of what the uh, sort of you know the macro environments the you know global macro sort of plays out i think for india that is something which we can continue to look forward to and finally the sector that i cover is 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 pharmaceutical especially the ones uh, on the on the generic side where you've seen 5 6 years of massive pressure you know uh, which has taken place again this is a sort of a expectation of a turn around uh, we have seen a little bit of that uh, more to go because i think when a company or a sector goes through a long period of uh, you know underperformance or challenges um, you know inherently they try to improve things inherently they take steps uh, it takes time you know to restructure the business bring down the cost what we are sensing is that uh, companies are finding their feet they are not clueless like you know if the fda inspections are happening i think they are much more prepared today uh, and we have seen some of the clearances happening so i think uh, that's something which we need to uh, sort of watch out for and again a sector where there is a lot of apprehensions uh, you know in the market uh so so th- i think these are the few selective themes you know which uh, you know, i would uh, you know recommend that one can uh, look at and you know pick uh, stocks from here there's a bit of a dichotomy there in that the first two have fairly stretched valuations compared to history and, and in case of capex related themes i mean i mean i'm just loosely putting it i'm not asking you to name but uh, the likes of i mean the mncs the abbs honeywells etc or some of skfs etc whatever all of them look so expensive and i understand your point that it services don't look at them from the prism of what happened in the past but broadly on a individual basis to it services are no longer cheap per se and versus that the generic pharma is probably trading at the nadir that they may have ever traded at so uh, is there a how do i say it? is there a weightage yeah. that you give to uh, the valuations and therefore more constructive one pharmaceuticals or are you equally constructive on all simply because the earnings growth will look solid no i mean uh, so pharma obviously has a lot lower weight so if you look at uh, the active because you know in the overall portfolio pharma would still be small compared to let's say an it services so uh-huh. you would put more money right because just because those are larger sectors but active overweight if you see in our portfolio also pharma would be sort of you know bigger active overweight than it services so you know i mean in our portfolio we have been 
we have reduced our weightage on IT services versus okay. what we okay. had earlier. But but the, but still we are overweight. Oh, we are still over overweight uh, because you know. See the thing is that uh, you know if you look at the construct of the market. Uh, so what excess liquidity or lower cost of capital does is that it increases the sensitivity of valuation to growth. So sure. if, you know if you if you are but which is under question mark, right, Sayam? Everybody talks about how uh, liquidity drawback would actually bring down the multiples. That's what's hurting global tech any which ways. So you know, so see, see, there, there are two opposing factors here. So obviously, okay. citrus, citrus parables. If you assume that your growth expectations do not change, right? So as liquidity sort of comes down, as uh, rates go higher, uh, you you would have valuation contraction taking place. Even there. So if you think about, uh, let's say, internet names, or if you think about technology stocks, which are far dated equities where the cash flows are going to come like many years down the line, they you know, there the contraction is a lot higher. IT services is not, you can't call them like really far dated, right? I mean, these companies are generating cash flows and they are, so so the point is, you know, the uh, uh, liquidity supporting withdrawn and higher rates are negative in general for risk assets, including equities. But if you have a component of earning surprises, right? So that counters, uh, uh, you know that right. counters the uh, you know the, this liquidity withdrawal. And by the way, see, I mean, we as a base case, we are incrementally worried about liquidity. But you know, the case is as I mentioned to you, even uh, our macro team is expecting the balance sheet contraction, which still remains much above the pre-pandemic right. level. So, so what I'm saying is, as a base case, the liquidity is still expected to be good enough uh, versus the pre-pandemic level. But of course, right. it is going to come down uh, from the from the highs. So we need to look for sectors and stocks where you think the earnings expectation and growth expectations are going to change on the positive side. And IT services, you know, still fit uh, that bill. And you know, we are seeing that in the quarterly results as well. So, so to that extent, uh, you know, I think we can remain uh, overweight on uh, you know IT services. Okay, fair call. Sai, so I would have loved to talk more because would have loved to get a perspective on some of the others. But afraid we are out of time on this show at least. But Take a moment to thank you for joining in today and talking to us about a really, really well-written note. So thanks so much for doing that today. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you. Uh, pleasure was ours and viewers, thanks for tuning in. Done.